Hello, I'm joined by Lawrence Baxter, who's the acting policy manager at the Civil Aviation uh, Civil Aviation Authority's GA unit, GA and RPAS unit, I believe it's called these days. Um, Lawrence is looking after the simplification of licensing consultation, and the plan is we're going to talk to him, see if we can't simplify the simplification consultation. I've just stolen a line that he, he gave me earlier. Um, Lawrence, thank you for joining us. Thank you too, and it's really a pleasure to join you today. So I'm, I'm guessing the consultation is, is the consultation is running to actually elicit responses. So let's see if we can't kind of just run through it, simplify it, and, and kind of encourage people to, to respond. Really, in a nutshell, we are looking to do a major sort out of GA pilot licensing and training uh, following the, the UK's exit from the EU. Uh, we've got this once in a generation opportunity to have a major sort out. For starters, we've got to consolidate two lots of regulation that we've uh, we now have post EU exit uh, and we are also while we've got it all out we might as well look at how we can simplify it and make it better and more workable and more intuitive for not only existing pilots but new ones as well. The first part of the consultation effectively justifies the consultation I would say it kind of says well we asked what people wanted sorting we, these are the opportunities so when you actually move on to the consultation itself, it's broken into three different phases. Is that right? That's correct. It's this is the first phase, which is the broad strategic direction, the may, the broader architecture we'd sort of want to see in the licensing structure. Uh, the, the, we're looking at the um, the ICAO compliant licenses and the sub ICAO ones, and also what we're going to do about existing licenses when the uh, we introduce a new legal framework so that's really what this one's about there's the broad direction of travel then phase two we'll start looking at the details the individual licenses ratings instructor and examiner certificates training requirements syllabuses not just for aeroplanes, but also helicopters, gyroplanes, sailplanes, and balloons. That's in phase two, the detail. Uh, then in phase three, we should, when we arrive at some recommendations for changing the legislation and for new and specific rulemaking, then in phase three, we will start to implement that rulemaking and start to draft up what the new regulations would look like, but also do it in a way that's easy to follow. Uh, we don't. We want to avoid, where possible, the legal, detail, legal language, and make it quite accessible. Um, and then, in, in, uh, rolled into that third phase as well is how we communicate it, because what we don't want is people to be experts of regulation. I'd rather they be experts of flying aircraft and operating aircraft safely, rather than being experts of trying to understand the rules. And that's so. What we're trying to do is create a simpler. And, and communicate it simpler. I think it's definitely true that people who, people who fly, certainly people who fly for fun, do it for the flying rather than, oh, this is a great opportunity to learn some regulation here. Um, but, but just to go, to go back a couple of steps, just for anyone who's new to aviation, um, would, I be, would I be roughly correct in summarising that sub-ICAO is effectively a national licence, that it's the rules that we can set that people can do stuff within our own airspace, and ICAO is basically the worldwide licence. So if you have a PPL, that should be recognised in some way by other ICAO states and it enables you to fly overseas effectively. That's exactly right. We have the, the International Civil Aviation Organization, the Chicago Convention, um, which, uh, which confers rights to, to operate um, your aircraft in other contracting states outside the UK. Um, and then the license allows you to, should allow you to do that. Um, the Sub-ICAO, we call sub-ICAO the national licenses, the, the, the ones that allow you to operate an aircraft over the UK airspace only um, and, 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 and uh, subject, exercise privileges of ratings or national ratings. So that is the distinction. So we've got two sets of licenses already, it's the ICAO ones and the sub-ICAO ones. I think when you're talking about the sub-ICAO stuff, you're talking about MPPLs, LAPLs, MPPL with ratings for SS simple single engine aircraft and touring motor gliders and micro lights and, and et cetera. Um, one of the problems in the past is that kind of mishmash hasn't always allowed uh, a pro progression, if, if I can use that word, where someone says, you know what, I want to fly my micro light or I want to fly a different aircraft and I want to fly it to Italy. And therefore, I want to go and get an IKO PPR. There's not always been a, a clear and hurdle-free pathway to do that, has there? 
That's absolutely right. I, probably the best example to give is when we were at a, um, at a, at a, at a rally or fly-in event uh, at a CAS marquee, and we regularly get people coming to us saying, I've been flying a microwave, for example, for hundreds of hours. Now I want to fly. And now I want to fly a larger aircraft and I want to get a PPL, a proper IKO PPL. How do I do that? And we don't have to give the answer. The process is just not intuitive. Basically, the person's demonstrated the ability to fly an airplane safely, um, what is ostensibly an um, uh, not terribly much different from the types of aircraft that an, a PPL would offer you privileges for. Not a huge weight range, weight, weight difference, and not massive amounts of handling characteristic differences. Person's flown a three axis microlight for a while. Why should they have to go effectively back to a significant to a major course of, course of instruction in order to furnish them with the RKO license? And that really makes you think about what how intuitive is the system. Now the pathways are there. I'm not saying they aren't. But should they be a little bit simpler and should they be a little bit more intuitive, given what the pilots demonstrated capabilities? In, in the second phase, or in this phase, you, you, you've asked people to comment if there are any areas where they think the, our current licensing go beyond the IKO requirements. So how, how do we currently make it more complicated than it needs to be? Um, have you got any examples of stuff that people might... Uh, any, any, you, I'm presuming you've, you've got a few ideas in your head anyway. We looked at this in the working group of uh, of, of GA community members that we uh, that we we formed and, and which helped us create this consultation. And there are a number of areas where you've got the ICAO requirements uh, set out in the uh, in, in 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 the ICAO regulations, and then you have the European the ASA Part FCL requirements. And we noticed it in in some areas. There was quite a there were quite a significant jump in requirements. One area I a good example I think is theoretical knowledge. I regularly get uh, questions from people in the community, and one I think is really it comes to mind is the um, person said to me, "Well, look, I really noticed that we've seen in the UK and, and under EASA rules, we seem to have a significantly large number of exams to sit." It just, whereas in other jurisdictions that are ICAO, fully ICAO combined and have a perfectly good safety record, you could just do it in one exam, one straightforward exam. Um, and yet we're required to sit nine under this system. And it just seems an awful lot of detail, an awful lot of, um, of, of hoops to jump through for someone who is only ever going to be a private pilot. Now, if they, of course, the difference for commercial requirements uh, are, are there and, um, and 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 if you wish to have a call to commercial license, there are more requirements to have, and that those are quite justified. But for a private pilot, do they need to know significant, significantly more, demonstrate significantly more than other ICAO member states require their pilots to do? And that really, that's a, I think that's an example. I just take the opportunity to chuck in a little comment of my own here, which which is that in, in the UK and, and Europe, we do tend to say, okay, well, we need to guard against this, 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 and we put all sorts of procedures and requirements and everything in place in order to to try and make sure that everybody meets those requirements. Whereas in in other places, they say, well, here's an instructor, he'll sign you off when you're ready, when you reach that standard. Here's an examiner. If you pass the exam, then you've reached that standard we, we we kind of almost it almost feels like we don't trust instructors and examiners and we kind of feel the need to put in place lots and lots of structures and hoops to make everybody jump through just for a little bit of peace of mind but that's just that's just a personal view that's a really good point i thoroughly agree with you ian um that is you've got to remember that the a lot of the easa part of cl requirements are there for harmonization between 27 member states there is there is a result of a huge negotiation, and I'm sure many viewers will remember some of the, the discussions to create some of those um, rules that are in part FCL right now. And one member state wants this, another member state wants that, another member state has this experience, another member state has that experience. And there, as a result, we get a lot of awful lot of content in the uh, retained regulations that are really there to satisfy a compromise across those member states. 
Whereas you look at the other, another country outside the ASA, another ICAO jurisdiction, they have a far simpler structure because they are the, the requirements are there for their needs and their unique community as opposed to another member state's community. And that is what we're trying to address here. There are some cases there where we look at the um, part FCL requirements, specific part FCL requirements in phase two, we are going to look at, is there a, is there a adequate safety reason for the UK for that, for that requirement to still be there over and above what is what ICAO requires? And if that is, is if, and we, if that, if there's no safety justification, there's no justification from the G, UK GA community perspective, then that is uh, that we need to look at that. We need to explore whether that needs to continue to be there. There was a time when you walked through the Civil Aviation Authority and had meetings with people there. And if anyone dared mention in a meeting another National Aviation Authority, um, for example, the FAA, you could literally look around the room and see everyone from the CA rolling their eyes and going, oh, they don't understand, they don't have to do it properly, we're the only people who... And I've never really met a regulator anywhere in the world who doesn't think they're only the real people who understand it. Um, it has, that, has that changed? Are we able to, to break through that and look at best practice elsewhere? Definitely. Uh, we regularly look to best practices in other jurisdictions, uh, the US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. We, I mean, part of the CA has regular bilateral discussions with them um, with a view to uh, agreeing aviation safety uh, bilateral agreements with them. So we do have dialogue, a lot of dialogue bilaterally with those, with those, those countries and those uh, national aviation authorities. So, and also we look at, um, and how they uh, how they communicate with their community, and for and we look at ideas, and and so there are there's definitely an exchange of ideas that goes two ways as well. Often other other those jurisdictions look to the UK examples, so there is a bit of a two way street happening, and that definitely happens both formally through bilateral discussions, but also informally. We just look to see what they're doing on their website, how they're communicating with their community, how they're explaining, how they're, um, how they're advising pilots to respond to situations. Um, so just bringing things back to this particular thing, it seems to me, looking through it, that, that part two when we're, when is kind of the large part of work. That's probably the seems to me one of the biggest parts of the work from, from a kind of outcome point of view. Do you have any... I mean, the, the, the consultation for this phase one ends in December, I believe, uh, December 16th from memory. Um, do you have any idea of when you hope to bring out the consultation for phase two? Very difficult to answer that, Ian, to be honest. I don't want to sort of pin ourselves down to a specific date because there are so many moving parts to this, not that and many of which we can't control. Uh, so we are we're going to try and um, uh, get something make some good progress on this um, in, in through 2023 and hopefully get something published by say the back end of 23. Uh, but that's that's my aspiration. Uh, as you rightly said, the um, it's 16th of December is the closing date. We've so far received 605 responses, uh, which is really good. Uh, we've got 44 days left in the um, in the consultation. I am really hoping to to hopefully double that response rate we've got. I want a good range of people to answer this, not just the people who usually respond to these sorts of things, not as, as much as we enjoy working with them, not just the associations that are um, that's, that helped us prepare this, but I want to hear from a wide variety of pilots and other users of general aviation licensing um, to, uh, to, to give us their views. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a we'll get a hopefully wide perspective on this. Well, I submitted my uh, application this morning before we before we spoke. I just wanted to see how long it took and what the process was like. And I have to say, um, the the actual responding to the questions and, uh, online, the, the system was pretty slick and and took less than ten minutes. Um, the the real meat, of course, is in reading the consultation and reading about it. Putting you on the spot, when do you think the Civil Aviation Authority might issue its first new shiny, super simplified IKO PPL? I would Very. love to be able to say year after next, but um, Ian, there are so many moving parts to this that I cannot honestly tell you. Um, 
even the transition stuff that you talked about is isn't going to be easy um taking taking an existing license and turning it into a new one uh without having to get people to do training if they if we possibly avoid that we will just that is good that in and of itself is going to be a challenging process so i want to i want to reserve judgment as to when we start seeing our new shiny shiny license um but uh we'll try and get that done as soon as possible but you gotta remember i want this to be I don't, we have it all out now this is a once in a generation opportunity to do this i don't want to be back here in a few years time doing it again <laughs> i don't want to be doing it again in 10 years time even i want a system that's i want we i want to create a system that is going to last for a long time so we people are getting tired of consultations and change let's do this properly and then leave it and then if but if it takes a little bit longer to do it properly so be it oh, I've, I've only been around in the business for 29 years and i can't remember a time in those 29 years when there wasn't change going on mm, absolutely so let's, let's hope that we end up with a and there are plenty of examples around the world of, of fairly good simple systems particularly including the whole renewal by experience thing we, we that's an area that seems to have gained a, a particularly special place in the minds of those who like to complicate things over time mm -hmm. um when it could be so simple so i'm kind of hoping that that simplifies and, and i guess the other thing and this is a, a plea on behalf of uh, on behalf of everyone i know in aviation anyway it would be a really it would be the thing you mentioned about net additional training which you're trying to avoid it would be it would be somewhat dismaying were people to need to do extra stuff to carry on doing what they're already doing and have been doing for a long time absolutely right and that's exactly what we want to try and avoid um that i, I i'm a pilot myself i don't want to be stuck doing training again for something to demonstrate something i already know so i absolutely want to avoid that um not just for the sake of the the general aviation pilots themselves but also our shared services center who is going to have to process more stuff we want to try to reduce the burden on pilots and ourselves in the process we don't do something that's going to make it difficult for ourselves as well so that is absolutely what i want to try and do um and we don't want this process of simplification to make things more complex for people. Thank you very much for that. Um, again, I'll encourage people to go and read the consultation uh, and, and partake in the consultation. Uh, thank you very much, Lawrence, for your time. Thank you indeed. Clear prop. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for watching.